Keep going. We're going to sound this down. Like, minimize the stuff there. Minimize that. All right, should be good. Um, and although like folks can ask like questions on chat, most of the people are here. So most people who are live focus on questions. You know, that sounds good. Is there? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of here. So, what like a flicker to hold? I can go like this. If it fails to go, just click back on the slide. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just we'll start writing the whole information. Whatever time we're at, it's not in the hour. I'm not going to sit here for the hour. I'm not going to sit here for the hour. I'm I also got a new I got one minute. I'm ready. Okay, everyone. I'm really excited today. We have Dr. Matt Allen over from Wildlife Ecology and Conservation um, to talk to us about Jagged and Paddle Conflict. And I think from the yeah. uh, the sneak preview I got of the slide that you're going to tell us a bit more about all of these exciting logos. Oh, yeah. um, but just to say that he is doing a lot of work on the impact, um, sorry, it's 
looking at participatory research on wildlife conservation and management, but comes through to here um, through one of our programs here, PhD in FNRE, um, also has a master's in zoology and a BA in biology in Charleston. And so spent a lot of time going through zoo collections, which is near and dear to my heart as sort of the route to a conservation in the field program. So thank you very much for being here. Great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have at any time. So feel free to stop me in case you forget to get to the end. Um, I'm going to cover sort of a, a broad swath of what uh, I do and what my lab does over in New and Ziegler. Actually, my office is on Maori Road, so way farther out from New and Ziegler. But, um, and uh, the work that we've been doing in Guyana for more than the last decade. Uh, and then hone in on the jaguar cattle conflict stuff because that's what we're working on a lot recently. Um, so first, who am I and why am I here? Um, I am from Chicago originally. I only bring that up um, because that's how I got into the zoo world. Not a lot of jaguars and tropical rainforests in the city of Chicago. Um, but uh, I came into this whole wildlife game through zoos, aquariums, museums, growing up in the city. Uh, and it's an important thing to know about me as well. I'm a lifelong Cubs fan. So uh, if you're wondering how am I patient enough to do this work so that all these camera traps come from a lifelong suffering Cubs fan. And I'm also a lifelong Bears fan. So conflict resolution is in my genes. Uh, growing up in the city of Chicago, it can be a rough place. So conflict resolution is a key skill that you learn from a young age. Um, as Sadie said, I went to undergrad at the College of Charleston, did my master's at my university in Ohio, not the Florida one, uh, and got my PhD here at UF. But I've been working in Guyana and specifically in southwestern Guyana for the last 13 years. I first went there as a volunteer. As you can see, I was working on a, a black diamond project, which is the largest uh, crocodilian in South America, at an indigenous run research station in the interior of Guyana. That's where I cut my teeth. That's where I made friends and built the network uh, that props me up today. And we support each other in doing all the work that I'm going to kind of describe. Uh, then I went back to school and sort of formalized all this work through more academic training uh, and learning. And But my goal is always to share back everything that I'm learning and doing with the communities that I work with in Guyana um, <clears throat> and to help make their lives and our work a little bit better. Um, the zoo thing comes into play as well because my position here at UF, I'm an assistant professor in WEC, but uh, my position is supported by Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens. So the rough split is that UF pays me to teach, to mentor graduate students, um, and then Jacksonville Zoo pays me for conservation specific work down in Guyana and here in Florida. So while the work that we do is academic, we publish papers, we do all, we have graduate students, we do all the typical sort of university stuff. Um, part of the year, I have a specific and explicit conservation and management focus where the goal of the Jacksonville Zoo, part of my job is to make positive impacts on the ground for people's lives, conservation in Guyana specifically. And the connection on that is that they have a range of the Jaguar exhibit at Jacksonville Zoo. Some of those animals came from Guyana, 15 years ago or more, they were backyard jaguar confiscated animal kind of, it wasn't like they went and caught wild animals and brought them to the zoo. They were animals that needed to be rehomed and came to Jacksonville. And Jacksonville Zoo has maintained a relationship with Guyana ever since. They support scholarships at the University of Guyana field work. They support the zoo in Guyana, but increased their contribution to work in Guyana by making me their, uh, one of their conservation biologists in residence. And so my work is focused on their South American program, which is all takes place in Guyana. So all the work you're seeing here today is sort of this balance between my time at UF, my time down in Guyana for the zoo, and I'm constantly going back and forth. So you see me a lot in the fall, not so much in the spring and summer because I'm, I'm gone a lot. Um, and the zoo world has been, as I said, it was part of my, uh, part of my upbringing in Chicago, but all of my first jobs I've worked at North Carolina Zoo, South Carolina Aquarium, Shedd Aquarium, Chicago Lincoln Park Zoo. I've come full circle now 
no longer a keeper, no longer a zoo educator, but one of those uh, guys that works at the zoo, but is hardly there. <laughs> it was always a goal. So just because I always start talks about Guyana with this, just to make sure that we're all centered in the right place. <laughs> I have relatives that even 12 years later are asking me, how was Africa? And a lot of people know about French Guiana for some reason, more than Guyana or Ghana or Guinea or all these other places. Uh, one of the small countries here in the northern part of South America used to be called British Guiana, probably most famous for Jonestown. That's the thing that everybody knows about Guyana if you know nothing else. Um, but it is a beautiful place that's rich with culture and natural habitats, amazing people. Uh, it's become my home. And I, since I first went 13 years ago as a volunteer, I haven't stopped. I go six or seven times a year or more. And um, it's like visiting family as much as it is like doing research. So it's my favorite place. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you a bit of overview about the ways that we use spatial data, which might catch your interest, even if you're not a wildlife person in our work in Guyana. Probably the, the simplest way is by understanding species distribution. So this is a, a little known species called the bush dog. Uh, it's a basset hound size and shape wild canid. Um, they live in packs. Uh, they are vicious little things. They are semi-nomadic and highly carnivorous. So something like a wolverine, right? Imagine if a wolverine and a basset hound crossed <laughs> somehow uh, and then lived in tropical rainforest. That's sort of what a bush dog is. And really getting even a single photo of a bush dog on a camera trap is a warrants of publication, uh, which is something that we did during my master's, right? The first, first ever uh, photographic records of this species in Guyana. Um, I went around and was doing presentations on this to villages uh, in the interior where I work. And when I said that this was the first record of Diana, I got laughed out of the village meeting because people started shouting out, I saw one two weeks ago. And I sort of really humbles you that, you know, so the first scientific record of this species, even though people that are hunting and fishing and farming for a living know a lot about these species. So we've been building on these first records over time, adding lots more camera trap photos, but also, uh, <clears throat> information from local observations and trying to document, support local knowledge of these species to really round out what we know about them. Because they're really, I mean, we've been doing camera trapping for more than a decade. We've got, I don't know, 5 million camera trap photos or something like that in a big database. And only about 12 of them are of this species. So uh, very rare, they need big intact for us. Um, but uh, these data, spatial data points can give us some information, at least on a range-wide scale, about where they are, where they're going. We've used spatial data from camera traps and also anecdotal reports from hunters to predict the spread of an introduced species. So uh, <clears throat> this habitat is largely intact, so not a lot of non-native species around, but there is a population of feral Asian water buffalo that was introduced during the British colonial era and has persisted for more than 70 years in a dense wetland uh, in this area here. Uh, we documented them with camera traps, with anecdotal reports from hunters, different observations, and use that information to predict their potential spread based on the habitat characteristics. Um, another way that we've used spatial data, if you're interested in more, right, there's the, the paper that you can read uh, more into it. We use spatial information to understand the impact of uh, human activities like hunting. So in this region, uh, most of these communities that you see here are uh, small, like under a thousand people. Most of them are under 500 people. Communities made up primarily of subsistence farmers, hunters, and fishermen. People primarily hunt with bow and arrow on foot. Um, and so this is sort of low intensity hunting. Uh, but one of the things about Amazonian species is that we're still trying to get a handle on even basic biological information. Here in the States, we have 300 years of data on the impact of duck hunting and deer hunting. And so these huge data sets really drive our decision-making. But for tropical species, for many of them, we don't even know when they breed or where they breed or uh, because it varies so much from location. Even within Guyana, there are different breeding seasons for deer and peccaries and other things. So um, getting information on the impact of these low levels of hunting uh, is really important. And the good news is that we found that 
the, the current levels of subsistence hunting are largely sustainable in this region, which is a bit of good news where you don't get a lot from the news on these days. Usually you hear everything's going bad or hunting is unsustainable or you know, things going to hell. But in this case, right, uh, people seem to be doing a fairly good job at taking what they need uh, and not so much more. Again, more information there if you're interested. Um, we've also used spatial data to help plan for what we call wildlife friendlier roads. So there's a single highway that goes into the interior from so the capital of Guyana is Georgetown. It's on the coast on the Caribbean Sea. There's a single highway that goes that splits the country in two and goes to uh, the, border, the border with Brazil uh, at the township of Lethem. That the road is unpaved currently uh, and it's, it's an adventure to pass it. It can take anywhere between 10 and 10 hours and three days or a week. I don't know, people get stuck on the road and they're out there for days on end. It's more adventurous in the rainy season than it is during the dry season. But uh, there is obviously a plan in place to pave and upgrade that road. Um, Guyana is seen as a strategic location, particularly from goods that are going from the Amazon. It's a much shorter route to go from the Amazon north through Guyana and then to ports that could exist someday in the Caribbean Sea rather than sending everything down the Amazon River. Um, so there's been long been plans to upgrade this road uh, and we worked with a team to use three sort of indicator species. We use giant anteaters, jaguars, uh, and this is a black curacao, which is a, a crassid, a large bird like a turkey but a uh, species of conservation concern because they're large and tasty like turkeys. Um, we use these as our indicator species to understand connectivity within the habitat, identify uh, important places where wildlife are crossing the road, and then make specific prescriptions about uh, how we could use um, wildlife overpasses, culverts, a wide variety of things to help make this uh, road, if it's upgrade, more but wildlife friendly. Um, <clears throat> again, more information there if you're interested. Uh, we've used on a smaller scale spatial data to understand the impact of RIL is reduced impact logging uh, and the impact of logging roads. Um, I had a student at University of Guyana that was working with some camera trap data that we collected. Um, and so we had sort of multiple comparisons where we compared a log site to unlogged control sites. Uh, we noticed <clears throat> almost no difference between the large mammal uh, diversity and abundance. So this reduced impact logging seems to be working at least for large mammals. Uh, and then within the sites, one of the key findings was that closing roads is key. So when these sites are open, logs are built, logs are extracted, right? And then the, the logging company moves on. Uh, one of the key things is when you're finished to fell some trees that close access to that road, um, because then as soon as there's not a lot of logging company activities, hunters fill that gap by going down those roads that no one's using and is still open. Um, and if you close it off, wildlife uses it, wildlife abundance stays relatively same and access becomes the important issue. So that was a key sort of finding that helped some of our partners on the ground, but also this uh, sustainable reduced impact logging industry as a whole. Again, more information there if you're interested. Uh, and then finally, sort of a, an explicitly management project that we worked on recently, our team was contracted to develop national management plans for six species of concern in Guyana. Um, and we use spatial data to, to project um, habitat suitability across the country and the data that we had to make Conservation, uh, conservation, population estimates for these species of concern. So here's two examples. This is the lowland tapir, the largest terrestrial um, ungulate native to Guyana. Horses and water buffalo are bigger, but this is the largest native species. Uh, obviously, they're a big, needy animal that's desired by hunters. Um, Guyana is currently the only country within their range where they don't have full protection, so hunting is legal of the species, people use it for subsistence, it's sold commercially. Uh, and so our team worked together to understand what's happening currently to populations and prescribe management actions that 
uh, could be adopted nationally, haven't been yet, but could be adopted nationally. Uh, this is spectacle caiman. They're a species that's harvested and traded for their skins and exports um, skins internationally. And they're also used locally. And we did caiman surveys all along the waterways in Guyana, did the same thing, survey control and uh, test sites where they're harvested uh, and made for national prescriptions on harvest quotas and other activities. So, um, just a little bit of an overview about how we've used spatial data in different ways in Guyana to assist on not just the academic part. The papers are great, and we try to make sure that we follow up, that we share our lessons learned with the academic community. But lots of these projects have been motivated by that Jacksonville Zoo part of my job, which is assisting government agencies in Guyana on management and conservation, and then assisting our partners who are indigenous communities, local NGOs on the same on village planning, on regional planning and conservation. Indigenous communities in Guyana do own their land. They have title over their land. And so they're, it's within their rights to manage it and make decisions fully on their own. And so if we can provide assistance in that process by helping with data, capacity building, and training, that's one of the things I spend a lot of time doing. All right, so that was the overview. Now let me get to the Jaguar cattle stuff. Um, those are some of the other things that we do in this uh, Human Jaguar conflict project is new and it's ongoing. But I'm glad to share a little bit about what we are doing uh, to address an issue that's common across the range of the Jaguar. Jaguar is an emblematic species of the Amazon rainforest, right? Undisputed king of the jungle. I don't hear anything about lions, right? <laughs> jaguars, they're the king of savanna, right? But lion, but uh, jaguars are the king of the jungle. Um, and there's been an issue going on for hundreds of years, conflict between ranchers in the Amazon and cattle. And in many places, including this part of Guyana, retaliatory killing of jaguars in response to killing livestock is their number one threat um, because this is a place where habitat is primarily intact. And so this conflict is the major issue that they're facing. So as a little bit of history, um, Cattle ranching has been happening in this part of Guyana for nearly 300 years. So uh, the British colonial administration had something called the Rupununi Development Company, uh, which was a company that formed major ranches that supplied colonial ports and populations on the coast with ready beef. So the savanna uh, part of the south of southwestern Guyana is natural neotropical savanna. It's part of the Rio Branco savanna, and which connects to the Grand Savanna in Venezuela. It's a, not as big as the Cejado in Brazil, but it's, this, I think, the second largest tract of neotropical savanna in South America. Um, and just like the great American prairie in my home of Illinois, people see grasslands and think, what a waste. Mm -hmm. Let's put either livestock or crops here um, because there's nothing else really going on. And British colonial administration saw the Rupununi savannas in the same way. So let's fill up this place with cows and start making some money. Um, so that went on for a couple hundred years. In 1969, there was what's called the Rupununi uprising, where a bunch of cattle ranchers decided to side with Venezuela in an uprising against the government because they didn't like how they were being taxed, um, made plans. So as a, even more background, uh, Venezuela claims about half of the area of Guyana up to this day as their own, and there's a long-standing border dispute. So uh, there was this uprising, ranchers planned to side with Venezuela. Um, the uh, long story short, the uprising was squashed in a day. Uh, the Guyanese military came in. Richard Nixon intervened, asked Venezuela not to get involved, left the ranchers hanging out to dry. They all escaped into either into Brazil or Venezuela. And the reason that it's relevant is because it was on that day in 1969 that indigenous communities began ranching cattle because all of these big private colonial ranches all of a sudden were deserted because all the ranchers escaped into Venezuela and Brazil. And then all these community members said, hey, look, free cows. And they went to the private ranches and led those cows onto their own. And those formed the start of the herds that communities are ranching today. So it, this, this, situation isn't like some other places like conflict with lions in Kenya where relationships between indigenous people and cattle goes back for hundreds of years. We're talking about a fairly short history between cattle 
and communities. And you still have some private ranches that weren't involved in the uprising that are persisting uh, in those families still exist in Guyana today, and they continue raising cattle. Just curious, what's the uh, size of the herd about? So the largest ranch in the region has about 3,500 cows. Um, most of the, that's a private ranch that's still around. Most of the villages have somewhere between 50 and less than 500, I would say. And the entire herd? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's usually like each person has two or three or 10 or something like that. And then they all graze them together in one herd for the whole village. Um, there have been foot and mouth outbreaks over time that severely constrained the market for beef from this region. So beef used to ship into Brazil and it used to ship onto, out to the coast after a foot and mouth outbreak in the 70s. Those markets were restricted. So today, cattle ranchers in the region only can sell locally and regionally. Right. So the market for beef is really constrained, which makes profit margins in the beef industry razor thin or non-existent, right? And that's an important motivator for what we'll cover later. The whole region has about 40 communities and a township, maybe 10 private ranches, um, but cattle ranching is part of the economy and it's part of the culture of the place. There's, a, there's very much a cowboy culture in the region. The annual rodeo is the biggest event of the year. It's always held Easter weekend uh, and it's a lot of fun. And you have, there's a, a a famous book by a guy named Stan Brock, who was a, one of the hosts of Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. He wrote a book called uh, Where the Cowboys Are Indians. And it was about this place because a lot of the cowboys that work at these ranches, they have their own style. They ride barefoot with these uh, these spurs on their shins and, um, and they're from indigenous communities. So uh, this is the context where we're working. Again, here's, uh, here's Guyana, Suriname and French Guiana. Uh, this is why this part of the world is a wildlife biologist's dream, because all that green that you're seeing is intact tropical forest, right? The only red you see down here, deforestation, there's a little bit of gold mining in this part um, of Guyana, but I'm working down here in a region called the Rupununi, right? Rupununi, uh, and it's part of this huge tract of intact forest that runs across northern Brazil, this interior Suriname. And French Guiana. These maps look relatively the same, seeing that these are decade old. Yes. Yeah, I, I would say that um, there might be a little bit more. So in, in Guyana itself, there's an informal rule that mining is not allowed below the fourth degree parallel, mm -hmm. which is somewhere right here, they say at the waistline of Guyana. Uh, and so this part of Guyana is largely the same. There's probably more of these small uh, gold mining spots in the, especially in the northwestern and central part of Guyana, but um, deforestation, low deforestation rate has remained relatively consistent. Um, this is what the place looks like. You can see why I keep going back. Um, this is a village called Nappy. Uh, so most of the villages are situated within the savanna, um, but with close access to the forest. So there's access to hunting, fishing, collecting items for building household and fruits and medicinal plants and all sorts of things. Um, communities, most communities look very much like this, right? People have thatch roof, mud brick house. Um, they would have a farm somewhere here in the forest in some proximity to the village uh, and have some rotational agriculture in small, relatively small plots. Um, <clears throat> one of the lowest human population densities in the world. So. Again, if you like wild places and not a lot of people, peace and quiet this is a good place to be, which again is why I keep going back every year. Um, one of the things that I learned probably in that first year that I was there was that, you know, my assumption early on was that, you know, there was so much forest and abundant wildlife because there were so few people in this place. Um, but what I've learned over time is that, you know, the forest is still there because of uh, the actions and the active management strategies that communities have been using over time. Um, even going back hundreds of years, communities had management strategies for directional hunting. Like every year, the direction that you would hunt from the village changed. There have always been sacred sites, sites that were off, off limits to farming and hunting activities. So there's always been this kind of, even if it wasn't called conservation or management, 
there was this culture of thinking of the next generation or several generations down the line and how you can sustain resources. So I see our work today as a way to help communities uh, adjust with modern issues. So you have the threat of the road, which will bring a lot more people. There's high demand for resources, uh, infrastructure, uh, not just road, but communication infrastructure, refrigeration, uh, transportation access is increasing every year, which means that the demands on the resources of the region are increasing every year. You have climate change that you're throwing in the mix, right? You have a savanna habitat that fire is part of the ecology in a place that's getting hotter and drier every year. The rainy season's getting more erratic, all this stuff. So you have all these modern challenges. Uh, and I see our role as creating, collecting data to help communities adjust to these sort of um, modern and rapidly changing world around them. Um, so back to the human carnivore conflict thing. So uh, beef has a small regional market. Livestock are primarily managed in small free roaming herds, which means that they move around a lot. The region, as you would expect, with big chunks of intact forest and savanna, also has a significant jaguar population. Um, and Depredation events, so jaguars killing, jaguars or pumas killing cows is relatively infrequent, um, but because each person only owns a small number of cows, every loss is a high cost. So if you have only three cows, right, and you lose one, it's like losing a third of whatever's in your bank account for most people. People depend on livestock as an investment. And usually people will harvest and sell their cows when they really need money. So if there's a kid, that, a child that needs to go to school, they need to pay fees for dorms or transportation, those kinds of important household things. That's where when you go and you sell your cow for slaughter, if you go and you don't find it, and jaguars killed it and you find it rotting in the savanna, right? The cost is high. And then the retaliation is also uh, high accordingly. Um, so even though we don't, you know, when, if you calculate the number of dead cows that can be attributed to jaguars every year, it may seem like, oh, this is not super high. The response can be. Jaguars are protected in Guyana, uh, but the areas that we're talking about working here are quite remote. And so the most of the enforcement of rules comes at the village level, not from federal laws sort of coming down. Um, so over time, we've been collecting data on jaguars using camera traps. Um, and so my master's thesis and my dissertation, at least parts of it, were dedicated to doing these camera trap surveys and estimating population density estimates and understanding how jaguars are using this dynamic habitat with savanna, forests, mountains, swamps, and everywhere in between. What we learned is that they use every stitch of the space. So they use the open savanna. They use gallery forests, which are narrow forests that runs along creeks and rivers. They use book islands, which is a local term for forest fragments that grow sort of within the savanna habitat. So they use gallery forests like corridors and bush islands like stepping stones to move through this open grassland. Um, they use riverine forests. So this, this forest would be uh, is along major rivers and would be 30 feet underwater in the rainy season. All the trees here are adapted to being submerged for part of the year, but jaguars are a water loving cat. I'm probably have seen those National Geographic videos of the jaguar jumping in the water and killing the kind of even if you're not a big wildlife person, most people have seen those. So they're, they're not like your typical house cat where they don't like water. They love to be in the water. Um, they thermoregulate in the water. So they just sit in the water to cool off. Um, and they're also powerful swimmers. So dealing with a flooded forest is no big deal for them. Of course, the lowland forests, they're the king of the jungle, as I said, so we see them there. And at the tops of all of the highest mountains in the region, which if you're from the Andes or the Himalayas, right, the mountains in this part of the Antarctic like hills, you only go up to about 3,000 feet. Um, but still, if you're a 250 pound jaguar hauling your backside up to the top of all these mountains, just for, for fun is, a, is an effort. And we see jaguars sort of all over every part of this space. So over the first part of our research in Guyana was really sort of trying to get a baseline understanding of where, how is this population using the space? How many animals are there? We, we feel confident that this is a globally significant jaguar population, which means that it has 
likely has more than 600 individuals, which is a lot of, for a big cat uh, in a fairly small area. So we're dealing with a population that's important globally as far as managing the species goes. And so then the next step, logical step was, well, how do we attack the biggest issue that this species is facing? So unlike other places in the Amazon where deforestation and habitat loss is a major issue, right? Fortunately in the interior of Guyana, that's not uh, a major issue as of now. So trying to understand this human jaguar conflict thing and attack it head on became our goal. Um, I won't dwell on this too much here, but most of our, the vast majority of our research team in Guyana is made up of uh, indigenous villagers, right? So there are at least two main tribes we work with, Makushi and Wapishan, uh, are the primary uh, indigenous groups in the region. We work directly with communities and with local organizations and focus heavily on capacity building so that all of the work that we're all this camera trapping, all the other stuff uh, is carried out for the most part by uh, people that are from the communities that are trained to do the work. Um, we put a lot of time and effort into building capacity and thinking about developing people um, and building skills that will be transferable to other jobs in the region, ranger, forester, tour guide, you know, all these sort of environmentally related jobs, working for conservation NGOs, any of this stuff, or moving up the ladder on our teams and moving into leading teams, compensation increases as your responsibility increases, just like any other job. And I treat our local teams just as I work with them in the very same way that I would work with a graduate student. So thinking about how, what skills do we need to focus on and what activities do we need to build those, right? So I have a, a fairly low, uh, most of my graduate students that are here are from Guyana. I have a fairly low number in my lab, but our team in the interior of Guyana numbers about 150 people. Um, and people, it's not like nine to five, 40 hours a week, right? People, some people work one week a year, other people work you know, pretty consistently every month. Um, but even if you, most people in the interior, if you said, I got this great job, pay you a nice salary, you got to come into an office every day from nine to five, 40 hours a week, every week of the year, they would look at you like, what are you nuts? Why would I spend so much time working? <laughs> right? I need to go to my farm. I need to make my own food. I need to go it out and fish. I need to do other things, spend time with my family. Why would I you know, commit all that time to just work? So uh, the schedule works out okay in that we're able to provide intermittent work. We pay uh, fair compensation to all of our workers. And as I said, put a lot of effort into um, building capacity over time. So all the stuff here, um, I, we have a leadership team. We work together to identify and develop this project. I go provide training, equipment. We work out all the methodologies and then the local teams take it and run from there. These, I used to do a ton during my master's and PhD, a ton of setting cameras myself and doing a lot of field work and stuff like that. I was in much better shape in those days than I am now. And now I find when I go, I'm mostly just slowing the teams down. They don't really need me anymore. And they're just like, you be the funding guy and the project guy and planning guy. And just leave the field work to us, which makes me sad sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, to sort of lay the groundwork for this project. So uh, the, the approach that we developed together was that uh, there were still some gaps. We needed to understand the problem uh, and then work together to identify solutions that we would identify key strategies for reducing conflicts, model those, monitor them, and then continue to adapt. So we're somewhere in the middle of the project here now, but uh, I'm here to share with you what we learned about the problem. Uh, so first we carried out conflict mapping workshops. So these were sort of like community mapping activities. Um, I worked with and trained a team, you see their names here, that carried out all of the workshops. Um, what I had learned over time about um, human jaguar, that any information about human jaguar conflict, and it's particularly about retaliatory killing of jaguars, is very sensitive. Right, uh, it's technically illegal to kill jaguars in Guyana, although there is a provision that accounts for threats to life and property. Right, so you don't have to just let a jaguar eat you because it's illegal to kill it. And that doesn't happen really, by the way. It's not a jaguars don't typically 
um, attack people unless they're provoked. But um, so, but that law is something everyone knows about, and it makes it so that nobody really wants to discuss conflict between jaguars because they know that there's something that's not right about retaliatory killing there, and they're not really sure. So one key thing that we identified is that this face should not be present at any of these community workshops where um, you know human jaguar conflict is being discussed because just me being there would automatically change the way that everybody was talking about the issue. If we had a local team that was trained up, we had a methodology that we practiced, that we agreed on, that everybody was comfortable with carrying out. Uh, and then we had a, a reporting structure so that all of the data that was collected then could be transmitted back uh, to me and to graduate students who are working in my lab to work on the data end, then that would be the best way for us to get the most accurate information. So that was what we did. Um, we had some uh, information to really sort of reiterate that this was an important issue. Then we got into the spatial sort of mapping part. Um, I'll get into the data just a little bit here. So right away off the top, we found out we're on the right track. This is an important issue. So in this, uh, so only livestock producers attended these workshops. It could be any livestock, including chickens, pigs, sheep, right, or cattle. Um, but we wanted to sort of understand what are the important issues, any issues that are facing livestock producers. We found out right away that predation by large carnivores is among the most important issues. You see. Uh, cattle rustling is theft of cattle by other people. So there's a long-standing joke in this part of Diana that uh, there's two-footed jaguars and there's four-footed jaguars. And <laughs> both of them are equally as bad when it comes to uh, taking cows away. And so here you see both issues, see the two-foot and the four-foot rising to the top. Do you have any data on the actual numbers? Yes, yes. Um, so. I can't remember if I included it in here. I did. It was a. It was typically people were losing less than five percent of their herd each year, but for a build, the village herd as a whole. So the the number of animals that are lost is relatively low. <clears throat> um, the way that we did that process was we asked people to identify on a map locations where they found cows that they knew for sure had been killed by either jaguars or pumas. There's only two cats that are big enough to kill uh, cows and pumas mostly kill calves more than an, an adult uh, like mm -hmm. Brahma cow. And so people felt that there was probably more, one because this is a large area, so cows go in places then you just never see them again. Um, and then, and they can't go and, and find every cow. And then there were some that by the time you find them, they've already degraded to the point where you don't know what killed it. So we sort of isolated uh, the number, the amount of depredation that was happening to only instances where you knew for sure that this was a big cat that you killed your cow, but yeah, it was relatively low. It's about the same for cattle rustling then? Same cattle thing. rustling is much higher, yeah. So people, but again, it's, it's sort of something that people speculate about because you just, you know, your cows are out in the savanna, they're free roaming, people go out and look for them, and then sometimes they're just gone. Sometimes you find carcass, sometimes you don't. But there are, in, there are instances where rustlers are caught taking like, you know, a whole small herd of cows, uh, or they're caught by the police, or they're other things. So people suspect that rustling is a, is a much larger issue in terms of the number of animals lost, um, but that, yeah, they, they put um, predation by carnivores up there as well. Um, cows were ranked. This is this is a little confusing. This isn't like the number of animals lost. Chickens in this, for instance, are much higher. And chickens are lost to birds of prey, to snakes, to big lizards like tegus, a whole wide variety of animals. Um, but cattle are the most important animal, livestock animal that's depredated by wild carnivores. So it's in terms of uh, investment or overall cost or like the amount what's lost to you is sort of the way that we structured the question. So again, an important issue. We're focusing on cattle. We see that this is the right animal. Uh, in terms of wildlife species that are offenders, you see that there's a wide variety of wildlife species that are eating domestic livestock. Um, but we see that humans, right, two-foot jaguar ranked as the worst of the worst of the worst. 
and then Jaguars and Pumas are both sort of close behind. Um, <clears throat> there was some interesting bit of, of variation here with humans. Um, there were a couple of locations specifically where uh, humans and cattle rustling was ranked really low as an issue. And then we had people in later workshops saying that those are the sites where all the rustlers come from. So of course they rank this as not an important issue. Uh, and so even, but even despite that, right, human and, and rustling ended up as the top uh, issue in our workshop. So after we sort of knew that we're on track here, this important issue, we got the right species that we're focused on. Uh, we moved into the mapping part of the workshop. Um, we added to these maps points of interest so that everyone can sort of reference or get a reference for what they're looking at, where they are, and how far things are apart from one another. They added important resources for cows, uh, any livestock management structures, corrals, fences, shoots, any of that stuff. Um, and then depredation events and retaliatory killing events that had occurred within the last two years. Um, we had, there was some other projects on, on this topic that did similar processes that showed that this two year time period is, seems to be reasonable for people to remember things accurately. If you're going back now 10 years or 20 years, right, things start to get over-exaggerated or a little foggy about where they occurred and that stuff. So we, we limited again to specifically instances where you knew jaguars and pumas were at fault within the last two years. We mapped those out across 12 communities and six private ranches across the region. Um, we ended up with these very detailed community maps, um, which are super rich. And I'm still, to be honest, in the process of georeferencing all of this information. This first part of the project is really focused on the, the uh, depredation and the retaliatory killing apart. But all of this other stuff are resources for cows. I mean, even though these cattle are free roaming, the assumption would be, well, you know, they're not very well, people don't, they're not very well taken care of, or people don't know them very well, because they just put the cows out in the savannah and let them take care of themselves. But the amount of knowledge that uh, these folks had about where cows go to find water, where they go to find browse at certain times of year, that they, uh, after the savannah burns, they lick the ash to get certain minerals, they go into creek beds and eat clay, they do all kinds of interesting stuff to cope with living in this tropical environment that burns in the dry season, floods in the rainy season, has poor soil and poor uh, grazing resources all year round, uh, has jaguars and pumas and people that are still right there. So there's a hostile environment for cows, not like a Jersey cow up in a nice pasture um, somewhere here in the States. Uh, here's an example of a, a, from a ranch, right? Not as widespread, right? You see some fencing resources and a corral and most of the things are congregated around the house, but Differences between village sites and ranch sites already showing up. <clears throat> uh, in terms of retaliatory events, you see uh, that right hawks were number one in terms of number of events that people mapped out. But we were learning that when it comes to chickens, and I had a graduate student that um, she graduated in December, no, in May. Uh, she was working specifically on the small livestock part of this. Um, we found through this project that small livestock were particularly important for women, uh, and it was an important part of the household, uh, and the chicken were basically under attack at all times, every day, all day long, from a wide sweep of predators, uh, and so that was the focus of her project, and she's gone back to Guyana, is now working for a development organization that's working on, specifically on developing the poultry industry in Guyana, which is great, but back to the cows and big cats thing, right? This number of retaliatory events in a two year period across 18 sites, right? When it's extrapolated across the whole region, this is an unsustainable number of retaliatory killings, right? Uh, and I would assume off the top that this is probably even a low ball, right? Still, even though we had a local research team and people felt comfortable sharing, people still feel a little bit cagey about sharing some of this information. So, uh, but this number is, you know, makes this a, a significant and an important issue for us to continue to follow up on. Um, okay, all right. So um, we did all that camera trapping. I showed you some of the photos. Um, during the mapping process, people identified that uh, water, specific water sources during the dry season are 
sites where there's high conflict. So we followed this up with uh, camera specific tra camera trapping at those sites. Here's a little bit about what we found. So we got three little piggies going to the market here. One of them strays away. Mama Jaguar comes to help that piggy get back home. And uh, just out of per convenience, comes right back to the camera uh, to feed on that little piggy. And uh, she leaves and comes back in the evening to feed again and then takes her food to go. Um, this was at a, a sheep farm. Um, and this was a really good say a sheep farm. You could a really good setup, close to the road, away from the forest heads, permanent sheep pen, dog guarding the sheep. Um, the family that was taking care of these sheep herds them in every evening into the pen, right? So we tried to select sites that we were testing here that were near water, but had different levels of uh, livestock management going on. And actually I was skeptical about setting up the cameras here because I thought that in a place where all going into their pen. Um, they were actually trying to rip sheet metal off the top, off the side of the sheet pen to get access to the sheep that are locked inside. Um, and she leave either the, the light from the camera or the noise uh, sort of frightened her, she leaves and then comes back an hour later. You see that this animal has likely an injured eye when one of them is reflecting. And she turns to the side, she's either pregnant or nursing. So notice that a lot of, uh, we get a lot of elderly animals are involved in conflict events um, because they get too old to hunt their native prey. Injury, rot and decay, old and tired, they want to hunt. We turn to livestock. The other frequent demographic that we get are pregnant and nursing because of the demands on the body of throwing a little jaguar or multiple and then feeding them, right? Cows are just standing around out there in the middle of Savannah in the middle of the day and they look delicious and too hard to pass up. Um, it, it's a kind of amazing really when you think about how infrequent this happens with how frequently it could happen, right? Because you have Roaming cows, they're not really guarded. They're out on their own. No, they're they're not super smart. Um, things are not great when they get scared. They all run in different directions, right? So it would be easy enough if jaguars wanted to, right, to make a living on cows, but they don't. But we know that there are these demographics that do it more often. Um, and just a couple last. So you can see here a really commonly used creek that cows go to drink. We've got a very powerful looking male jaguar coming to drink as well. Uh, a site at another ranch where we had another big male jaguar frequenting. There's a, a spring just down the hill at the back there coming multiple times um, to check out this site. In addition to just like the cool videos and pictures of jaguars. Um, what we was really interesting about these some of these areas was that uh, of all of the species that we caught uh, on these cameras, right, the livestock, if you include dogs and donkeys, right, made up more than two thirds of the total captures at these sites, right. So that tells us that not only that these were places definitely where jaguars and livestock are overlapping, but that jaguars are frequenting these areas and there's very little native prey there, right? So that tells us that either they're going there specifically to target cows or the presence of cows are allowing jaguars to persist in an area that they otherwise wouldn't be able to because there's not enough food, right? So this introduction of large meaty animals to a wild landscape, right? Might be not just uh, facilitating this problem, but creating it in some ways, uh, which I think was an interesting finding. The next thing that we did was we said, we need to learn more about what these cows are. I never thought going into studying jaguars and wildlife that I'd learned so much about cattle and livestock, <laughs> um, but we put GPS collars on free roaming cows 
Um, we deployed them. We collared 29 cows across all the different sites, the same sites that we did the workshops um, to learn more about how they move. Here's a quick example. So this is five collared cows from a private ranch called Davinawa. <clears throat> you can see here just in the buckshot of data that there's not a whole lot of returning to the corral and the ranch are right here, literally where the point is, right? These cows aren't, and this data was over like an eight month period. So they're not going back home every night and getting protected. And some of them are spending most of their time, you know, more than 10 kilometers away from the house in an area that's basically just sort of wild habitat. Um, we used time local convex halls, a T-local program in R to develop utilization distributions for each one of these collared cows so that we could understand their space use in terms of where they were going for habitat, um, but also uh, things like uh, behavioral things that um, we could understand over time, like the duration of time that they spent in certain areas or how often they were visiting certain areas, right? So if we could see sites that they were revisiting, that's a site an indication of an important resource like a clay lick or water source, right? Important grazing area. Uh, and then we could compare that data with all the camera trap data we've been collecting with Jaguars and try to understand this sort of spatial overlap. <clears throat> One of the things that I should have mentioned right off, I meant to mention that I neglected to mention right off the top is that um, I'm a field biologist at heart. That's what I love doing. And I feel like that's what I'm good at. Um, I'm married to a GIS analyst. <laughs> so, uh, the reason that I have a lot of this spatial data uh, and spatially focused research uh, is because I'm married to a brilliant GIS person who helps make a lot of this stuff possible. So uh, I don't. I would feel wrong trying to pretend like this is all my work and take credit for it um, because I've got really strong support when it comes to understanding these questions. But most of what we're trying to understand from a wildlife management conservation perspective is all spatially related, how things are using space, how things are managed over space and time. Um, so one of the things that really came out of this analysis of the collar data was that there were big differences in particular with how private ranches manage their cows. So this is a whole smattering of how one, one cow from one of the private ranches that we were working with moved around and how villages were moving their cows. So this is Nappy Village. Nappy has a reservoir that they maintain. They also have the vaquero, which is like cowboy, um, is a position that's paid by the village. So they're paid by all the cattle owners to manage the village herd. And that means that this guy stays on top of his cows and his cows didn't move around a whole lot. And they do go back to a corral almost every night. And we noticed that there were a lot more depredation events under these situations, depredation and retaliatory killing events under these situations compared to uh, sites where cows didn't move around very much. Um, we're in the prod, this is a very preliminary thing, so this isn't the prettiest uh, figure that I showed, but we're in the process of uh, predicting and mapping risk over the area um, because we're going from the understanding the problem phase to modeling solutions. And the purpose of predicting risk across the region is so that we could choose intervention sites in the highest risk areas, right? So this is based on how cows are using the space, where they're spending their time in terms of habitat use and proximity to resources, overlapped with what we know about how jaguars are using their space from camera trap photos, and then the high risk areas are high overlap zones. Most of those coincided with forested areas. So most of it was where cows are going into the forest or close to a forest edge is where they're at the highest risk. And the locations of depredation and retaliatory killing sites from the community mapping all overlap with these high risk zones as well. So it sort of tells us that we're also on the, on the right track from the data perspective, but then also from sort of the local knowledge perspective from the community mapping. Um, we're in the process of adding habitat variables and other things to make this fancier and nicer for a manuscript, but it's workable for now for sharing back. What was our next stage was hosting a big workshop with all the livestock producers that took part in the project. We presented all of this data back to them, just as I have to you, camera trap data, the workshop data, the GPS collar data that they all worked together with our teams to collect, uh, presented it all back. 
We discussed it, we created activities so that people could share ideas for how do we address some of the issues that came up? How do we reduce and mitigate conflict? Um, what are the key strategies? And participants identified the following set of strategies, more frequent herding, use of corrals, creation of alternative water sources, mineral and feed supplements, uh, fencing cows from staying out of jaguar hotspots like into forest and forest edges, um, better trained by heroes, keeping a conflict database, with, obviously with the, the potential for government compensation in the future was of interest, uh, and then further research and using research to assist management. So the, the GPS collars were of especially, were of major interest to, to the ranchers because right now for free roaming cows, Ranchers have to literally go out, jump on their horse, go riding in a direction and try to find their cows just by looking for them across what can be a very large area. Uh, and so it's time consuming. It's not very efficient. And when you find the cows, you got to try to round them up in the middle of Savannah and drive them all back to the house and they're all getting away. And it's just a big process. And so the ability to know where your cows are, even just sort of a general area where they are from GPS collars was of huge interest. and the, the limiting factor in this region is communication infrastructure. So there's not cell signal everywhere, even satellite internet is expensive, but it's also the coverage isn't that great. So getting real time data is harder, but if we can get more of these collars, more of this technology, make the searching process more efficient, right? It'll help. Ranchers indicated that that would help them keep a better eye on their cows, keep their cows closer and away from those hotspot areas. So we're trying to figure out how do we navigate the cost and technology issue of helping research sort of continue to inform this process. So <clears throat> as I said, this is where we are where we are now. We have our list of methods. We're in the process of costing and prioritizing how much, you know, like uh, some of these things, um, mineral and feed supplements are fairly cheap. Digging wells could be five grand US each, right? So some of these are more expensive than others. Which can we support? What sites do we want to choose? And then we'll begin modeling those strategies and monitoring over time. Did these strategies actually reduce depredation of cows and conflict? Did it increase it? Did it not? What did it do? How do we adjust? And this will be something that um, I plan to continue working on for as long as I keep working on and keep working in Guyana. This is a tricky issue that is eluding people all over the globe, big, big, large carnivore people, big cat people, uh, with snow leopards, with Persian leopards, African lions, with tigers, with jaguars, right? The issues are, uh, the issue is the same, that there's big cats killing livestock and people killing big cats in retaliation. The challenging factor is that every single situation is different and unique in and of itself. And so that was part of our motivation to have this. There have been lots of even human Jaguar conflict studies. Uh, and, you know, some people would say, well, why would you do this whole data collection thing? People already know about, you know, human Jaguar conflict. And I would say, well, this is, you know, every, every situation is unique unto itself. So if you don't uh, understand the situation where you are and engage people in the data collection process, then those uh, those solutions, right? These all came out of the workshop organically. I wasn't there. I wasn't even there actually, but I wasn't there going, well, what about more corrals or, you know, what about <laughs> minerals? That would be a good idea. You know, these people participated in the research and the solutions that they came, came organically through the process that they saw themselves. So um, that's it for what we're doing. Thank you again for inviting me. I know I went a little bit over time for questions, but uh, all this work is a team effort. I work with lots of communities across the region, local NGOs, ecologists, village councils, everywhere in between, uh, and they make all the work possible. Uh, and of course, my GIS support um, uh, is one of the most important things. We are uh, active on social media, so if you're interested in seeing and learning more about what we do, feel free to check us out there. And if we have time for questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you.
that if you want to. I think we also have a couple of questions. So the ranchers are encroaching on native habitat. <laughs> If they don't have title to that land, then aren't the ranchers responsible? And why should they be compensated? Yes, that's a good question. So the, the ranches in the region have leases to their land. Um, from the government? From the government. Yeah, so they're, and they're typically 99-year leases. So there's, it's an interesting system in Guyana that there's very little private land. Almost everybody, even like in the city, you would lease your land from the government. And indigenous communities are almost among the only landowners in that they own their land title as a title. So they do have, you know, some ownership through their lease um, in terms of asking for compensation. Um, and I think the, the ranches that remain in the interior, they're part of this sort of cowboy heritage, cultural heritage in the region. And Pretty much all of the ranches that are left at this point are doing uh, ranching and ecotourism sort of at the same time. So they're mostly part of this, you know, conservation management picture because of the tourism thing as well. And they're part of the fabric of the, of the region, I'd say. Thank you. I really enjoyed this quite a bit. Um, it was interesting to see the, the rates of deforestation so low in this region, mm -hmm. but it makes me wonder what the future holds with um, the big large scale infrastructure of Amazon. The Guiana Shield hub is going to cut right through that area. So right now there's on the Brazilian side, they've pretty much banked a lot on building that highway straight through yes. you know, Guiana to the coast. Mm -hmm. um, and it must, it must be changing a little bit already. Have you noticed? Any you know impacts? It seems as though more people would come, there would be less wildlife for the jaguars, mm -hmm. or create greater conflict. Yep. Are people you know discussing that, or is there a protest? Is yes. There some kind of yeah. Definitely, there's definitely a discussion about you know the road. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing because you. I have to admit that when when I'm here in Florida and I think about the road and it changing, mm -hmm. I think about. You know, oh, this is a really wild place, and the unpaved road is part of this adventure. And it's part of the region. And when I'm there, and I'm in a vehicle, and I'm dry traveling down the road, I can't you can't help but think, I wish this was a updated <laughs> paved highway. It would really save my back and save my patience and all that kind of stuff. And so I see, you know, people that live in the region, access to medical care, access to goods and services, and all this stuff will increase. And Potentially, their you know their well-being or their livelihoods could increase along with it. <clears throat> but that said, I think that people are are very skeptical of that being a major change that would come along with an influx of lots of people that are not from the region mm -hmm. with an interest in exploiting resources. They're already kind of moving over <clears throat> to mining and everything in the region. So yes, there's yeah. a lot of mineral wealth as well there in is. that part of the Amazon. Uh, yep. They've already discussed tapping into so yeah yeah i think that um i would say that i wish that mm -hmm. planning and discussion was farther along it's definitely something that people are talking about and that they're starting to try to plan for like the, the study that we did with the right. road planning was um supported by conservation international and it was supposed to sort of that streamline information to go to government for planning purposes but you know, you never saw like that. Yeah. Still, still. Little that it's the 1960s, they're going to build the road. Um, yeah. And Ursa was laid out 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. Yeah. And the, so Guyana also, because it's along the coast, I didn't really cover this, but in the last five years, they've become a major oil producing nation, mm -hmm. offshore oil resources. And so they're in the process of building a deep water port now to support oil refinery and shipping of oil, but it would serve the dual purpose of being a launching off point for goods from the Amazon. So I think, whereas 10 years ago, when I first, you know, I would have said like, oh yeah, they want to pay the bill, but it seems like kind of a far off thing that may or may not ever happen. But with the port going in, it makes it like, this is this is happening at some point in the near future. And investments from China and Iran and other, Hi. Hi. Oh, fantastic presentation. Thank you. It reminded me of my daily master. Loved it. Every mm -hmm. single bit of it. 
And uh, I have many friends who are working on similar stuff mm -hmm. with minimalist conflict in terms of books in grasslands. And uh, some portions, some, some of them are using collars mm -hmm. on those. Have you done any of that or was that a part of any of no, no, I haven't. We've only put that. So like when we did this work on the cows, it was our, our team, including my first work with GPS, collars and this kind of stuff. So we sort of saw, we knew we had lots of Jaguar data. We didn't have much cow data. And so we saw this both as an opportunity to get information for this project, but also as a way that we could all sort of learn mm -hmm. and build our capacity for using this GPS stuff. And the cow thing was not easy, right? Because these cows, some there are, there were two ranches that we worked with that had chutes, right? So they could bring the cows in, they could contain them, and then it was fairly easy to put the collars on. Others, some places didn't have corrals, so we had to go out on horseback and rope cows and throw them down, and then everybody's jumping on them and putting the it was like real Wild West style. <laughs> For a kid from Chicago, right? I didn't grow up riding the range and roping cows and that kind of stuff. So. Uh, that was like a big learning experience for us where I've sort of gone back and forth on the, I would love to get this like high resolution data, especially on Jaguars that are going around cows and people to see really how they're moving. It's been a question of risk for us. Well, cost, expensive technology. And even these, these 30 collars, I think at least 10 of them just flat out failed. Yeah. So. If you're putting on cows, it's not so much of a big deal. But if you go and catch a jaguar, then the equipment fails, and then you're really crying about it. So the risk to the animal and then the risk to our team without having experience doing that stuff and without having access to a lot of veterinary resources in the region has left us with thinking so far that we're getting the information that we need from cameras. And so maybe at some point in the future, you know, I or somebody else from the team will be able to go and get some training with sedating big cats in the wild and catching them and doing all this stuff. And then we could move forward with that. And that would be amazing. I would love to do it. But so far, we just sort of shied away from it because of the cost and the risk factor. I just had a follow up question mm -hmm. on this. Uh, I was just thinking about was there, since you interacted a lot with the indigenous communities mm -hmm. there. Did they report any specific individual among the Jaguars that have been visiting a particular spot regularly? And were you able to sort of distinguish the individuals when you were using camera traps? Yes. Uh, do you use mark capture, recapture mm -hmm. technology? Yeah, so my master's and my PhD dissertation were largely focused on doing that, identifying individuals and estimating populations and that kind of stuff. We did see. Um, <clears throat> I have seen individuals from cameras that we see repeatedly. And then I've actually seen those individuals like hanging on a wall, like their pelt hanging on a wall. Um, or I've seen like after a kill, somebody sends me a picture and I match it up to a, a spot pattern yeah. from camera trap photo. Um, so we do know that there are I, it, it's confusing. Most people say that, like, it's like sharks. You know, they say, oh, there's some rogue individual, like Jaws, and they they start, they get a taste for blood, and then they start hanging around. And, and I, I don't think that it's, you know, it's it's not, you do have some individuals, like there was one, one of the ones that um, I matched a, a pelt to camera traps. Um, I was there, I just happened to be in the village right after it was killed, and it was killed right at, like, literally at someone's front door. And it was coming behind the guy's dog. And so I did a, like a field necropsy of the animal. And it was the saddest wild animal that I've ever seen. It was ancient. Its teeth were all yellow. And they were all worn down, like to down to the gums. This, this cat had taken another dog from the same village. And the dog survived. The dog didn't have any hair on the back of its neck because the jaguar was literally gumming the back of its neck. <laughs> removed all the hair and irritated it, and then the dog just ran away, right? So you have some of these like elderly, sick, injured animals that do repeatedly, they kill dogs more than they kill cows. But I'm sure you have some that do a learned behavior. Then you have some that are just passing through. They see a cow, they kill it, they eat, they leave. And then some other animal gets killed in retaliation and it's the wrong one. 
you know, you get pumas that kill and then the jaguar comes and steals the carcass and gets shot, right? So with jaguars, one of the main things that we were learning actually through the poultry project was that people felt helpless in stopping wild animals killing their chickens because it's like an owl swoops down, takes a chick and then it's gone. Or a snake comes in at night into the coop and eats some eggs and then you only find sign of it. And so everything is happening so fast, like you can barely catch it in the act and get in retaliation. But jaguars make a kill, they stash it, and then they come back and they keep feeding until it's gone. Even pumas, pumas in North America do that more than in South America. They typically kill, eat, and then that's it. But jaguars return. And so it's like, we were hearing from people that this is like the moment for retribution because it's the only animal that you know comes back to feed and if you find a fresh kill and you find a nearby tree and you sit in the tree long enough chances are you might be able to get even right for your losses but that there are other jaguars there are pumas there are animal jaguars scavenge right they steal from all kinds of stuff is happening so the retaliatory killing thing is tough because you people feel like oh i feel better i you know avenge my the, my loss but might be killing the wrong, might be killing a healthy individual and that old one that's killing dogs and stuff still walking around or, and then the thing with the females with cubs, if you kill a female that's pregnant or nursing, right, you're taking, you're removing the next generation from population too. So that's another tricky subject that we've been trying to address with people. It's, it's very complicated. When I was started, I have a friend who works for Panthera. We were starting this project. We got the funding to move forward. And she was like, don't do don't do human jaguar conflict project. It'll just it's just frustration because it never solved the problem and you just keep going over it over and over and over again. But I feel like we've we've set a process here where we're we've engaged people, we're setting ourselves up to not solve the problem forever, but make some headway to make the problem better for people and for jaguars. Maybe I'm optimistic, overly optimistic. Thank you so much. Sure. Obviously, people are very excited about this topic, so feel free to reach out to Matt Moore. Um, thank you so much for sharing. No problem. Thank you for having me. I can hang around for a few minutes if anybody has something to ask. I'm curious. Um, 